grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to our service for the third Sunday after Trinity from St Mary's East Barnet, or at least from the vicarage that's the temporary rectory of St Mary's East Barnet. We do hope soon to be able to welcome you back into church for public worship. But for the moment, St Mary's is only open for private prayer and reflection on Wednesday mornings from 10am till 12 noon. You can find out more news about that and everything else that's going on in the parish. And you can also see an order of service for this service by receiving our news from St Mary's email. And if you haven't managed to get access to that, please contact the parish office to be added to the email list. All the words that you need for this service, however, should also appear on the screen and they can be downloaded through following the link below. You can then view that order of service as a browser image or by printing it out as A4 sheets or as an A5 booklet. As we prepare to open St Mary's for public worship, we are very conscious of the fact that over the last three months, we've not been able to meet together as a community. And so these broadcast services are one way in which we are bound together. One of the negative consequences of not meeting together as a community, however, is that the church's finances have taken a negative impact. If you can contribute to maintaining St Mary's, if you can contribute to our work in the community, if you can contribute to binding us ever closer together as servants of Christ, then there are many ways in which you can give, of your time, of your talents, and you can also make a financial donation. There are more details of these opportunities on our new website's giving page, and the address for that is just below. We confess now before the Lord our timidity, our unwillingness to go into the world with the name of Christ as our guide, our lack of welcome to those who have been sent to us as Christ was sent, to challenge us, to encourage us, to change us, to convict us in the name of God, to help us to grasp the very basic resources of our faith. We confess our grasping instead of the very basic resources of life from those who are in need and our failure to be faithful to Christ in challenging the systems of the world, those powers which limit the flourishing of all his people. Father, we have sinned against heaven and against you. We are not worthy to be called your children. We turn to you again. Have mercy on us. Bring us back to yourself as those who once were dead but to now have life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, may the Father of all healing and forgiveness draw us to himself and cleanse us from our sins, that we may behold the glory of his Son, the world made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we rejoice in Christ and in this gift of his new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and for ever. Amen. Our opening hymn is Ye Servants of God.
Our lesson from the Hebrew Bible is from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 28, verses 5 to 9. And it's read for us now by Ellen. This reading is taken from Jeremiah, chapter 28, verses 5 to 9. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessel of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Our seasonal canticle is a song of the Lord's anointed. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour, to comfort all who mourn, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. For as the earth put forth her blossom, and as seeds in the garden spring up, so shall the Lord God make righteousness and praise blossom before all the nations. You shall be called priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as ministers of our God. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. Our reading from the New Testament comes from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 10, verses 40 to 42, and it's read for us by Anthea. The reading is taken from Matthew, chapter 10, verses 40 to 42. Whoever welcomes you, welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the word of the Lord. If you'd like to contribute to this YouTube broadcast service by reading or by leading our intercessions, please contact the parish office. The Gospel Canticle is the Song of Zechariah the Benedictus. And we say this almost every week, but this week it's especially appropriate, for then the Church of England has commemorated the birth of John the Baptist, son of Zechariah. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Saviour, born of the house of his servant, David. Through his holy prophets, God promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father, Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, 
For you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of all their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. A gift of water. Whoever gives a cup of cold water to a little one who is named a disciple, truly I tell you, they will not lose their reward. The question of who Jesus says will really benefit from a good cold watering, like this one, in this passage from Matthew's Gospel, it is more than a matter of alternative biblical translations. Though you might have noticed in my way of introducing these words, I've made a slightly different translation from the composers of the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible from which Anthony was reading. In fact, to say I've offered a different translation is a bit of a sodden understatement. All this is a rather literalistic attempt to be immersed in the study of scripture. Anyway, when it is read in a slightly different and an equally appropriate translation. This short passage of scripture raises the surprising question of how the discipleship of the apostolic community, if you like, of the whole church, is deepened as the way of faith is travelled. It's deepened by the formation of new relationships. It's deepened by learning how to receive charity. It's deepened by being shocked out of a normal way of viewing the world, by the challenge of understanding other people's identities. It's deepened when those who are sent with the sanctioned authority of the church are confronted by the voices and the silence, the gift of water, that can be found in a genuine encounter with others. The translation of this passage in the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible assumes that the apostles are being sent in order to bring Jesus' teaching to the little ones, to share a privileged knowledge with people who have an eagerness to learn from what they have heard direct from Jesus. Two people who will experience Jesus' presence only through the presence of the Twelve, and the gifts of power performed and authorised by them in his name. And the translation presumes that the gift of cold water in the name of a disciple is a welcome, symbolic token that shows how even the smallest act of charity, from one who has received a greater gift, can be united as of a part with the healings and exorcisms the prophecies and the proclamations of the kingdom which the twelve have been empowered to perform. That in some small way, the little ones who give a gift of water can serve within the official mission of the church. And that therefore, welcoming its agents, they become welcomed into righteousness themselves. Now, in my translation, and in my experience, as a minister. The gift of water is always being given by those who receive them to the little ones, who are the ones Jesus sent out in order to learn from others. It is a gift to the church. In Matthew's Gospel, the twelve are learning from those who receive them. They're learning how to be themselves as their relationship with Christ progresses in relationship with others. They are learning how to be given gifts. They are learning what it means to be vulnerable and how to speak the word of God, who in the incarnation has given up all power. That means listening to others comes to carry a greater power than their own words. When structures of authority 
and particularly of institutional authority, are questioned or threatened or criticised, then those of us who hold a privileged position within an institution or given under that authority have a tendency to respond in two ways. Perhaps by a pretense of earnestness, a nod of the head, a press of the hand, in place of a deep listening. By a kind of virtue signalling that ignores any real criticism and replaces hard to hear words directed at oneself with memes or platitudes directed at another. By a kind of passing of the blame that is far easier than working to make any kind of real change in one's own hearts or in the wider public realm. The other way that people in this kind of position react is by cultivating an unthinking or a willfully mishearing invulnerability, by putting on a brittle carapace of denial and meeting accusations of one kind of prejudice with accusations of another kind of prejudice, by adopting stories about our position and our past that allow us to ignore the implications of other people's realities for a shared future. To water the church might mean to refresh it and nourish it from far beyond those places in which authority has traditionally been acknowledged to dwell, to wash away the dryness of these responses and to reveal the littleness of the church's existing discipleship through the refreshing and renewal power that comes from voices and silences which testify to the disordered forces operating within the world and through the church. A gift of water can represent God's creative action of challenge and desire for renewal of his apostolic community. Philip Larkin wrote that religion should be a furious, devout drench, that it should imply more than a peaceful tranquillity that hides us from problematic areas of existence. Instead, it should change, renew, it should pummel and shock. And by this kind of encounter, it should mean humankind comes to itself reclothed by the experience of worship, as well uh, as you can see from me, as by the necessity of being damp. The church is watered by unpalatable truths, spoken in voices of prophecy and acts of challenge to the status quo, even by voices of anger and division, even by voices quietened by powers that try to choke off their air supplies, even by voices that cannot breathe. It is watered by learning to receive the wisdom of those who have been ignored and diminished and abused. It is watered by attentiveness and by learning from others how to be attentive to the silenced and even to our silent planet because obviously the shadow of a lack of human care for creation is cast across the contemporary reporting of the horrific injustices of racism and sexism, sectarianism and homophobia, exploitation and violence. The any angled light that can shine through a glass of water and which shines through the gift of these waters to cleanse and refresh the church is the illuminating experience of realising that in challenges to the structures of authority, there is a welcome possibility that the deep, dark heart of human self-centred authority can, by such irrigation, experience a softening and that from it could flow justice and a true peace. Now let us express our faith in the words of the Creed. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful Father, we pray for the parish and the people of East Barnet, that they will know your love, live in it, and share its gifts with all around them. In our parish cycle of prayer, we pray particularly for those who live in West Walk and Windsor Drive, that in those and every place, true justice, mercy, and a common life that builds people up may be articulated and grown through your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the mission of the churches in East Barnet, for St Mary's, for Brookside Methodist Church, for East Barnet Baptist Church, and all the ways in which we cooperate together to declare with one voice but many tongues your love for our community. We pray that each and every church will be given a spirit of welcome to be challenged and changed by our encounters with others, by our encounters with people who are far different from us in terms of their life experience, and by hearing, with a deep listening, their stories of difference, of exclusion, of pain, of power, of diversity and of joy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <coughs> we pray for our Bishop Alan, and for Michael and Richard his suffragans, and for Archbishop Justin, Metropolitan of this Archdiocese. We ask that they might grow closer to the leaders of all churches and that relationships of justice and of peace may be fostered by their closeness to other Christian leaders, including Barbara, President of the Methodist Conference, John, General Secretary of the United Reformed Church, Francis, Bishop of Rome, and Bartholomew, Ecumenical Patriarch. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray also for the United Church of North India and Prem Chan Singh, its moderator, and the Bishop of Jalbapur. May those bishops who were due to be meeting as part of the Lambeth Conference also be bound together in your one spirit and by your one love, in a spirit of listening and sharing in your one truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are sick, challenged and troubled. For Trevor and Luke, for Janet and Angela, for Deborah and her family, for Jilly, Don and their family, for Terence and Jean, for Pauline, for Raymond, for Becky, for Chris, 
for Janet. For Tom, Lisa and the Wickenburg family. And as they settle into their new home, for Dick and Val. And as she takes steps of faith for Faye. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant, O oh Lord, your peace to all who are dying and to all who are bereaved. We pray that those who have been bereaved by COVID-19, by terrorism, by violence and by natural death, may know your presence and your comfort in their lives. And we pray particularly for the family of Agnita, that the comforting presence of the Holy Spirit may be support to them in this time of trial. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Saviour, Jesus Christ. Almighty God, you have broken the tyranny of sin and have sent the Spirit of your Son into our hearts, whereby we call you Father. Give us grace to dedicate our freedom to your service, that we and all creation may be brought to the glorious liberty of the children of God. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all, evermore. Amen. If, rather than water, you prefer your refreshments to be warming, then please join us for Coffee Without a Rotor. That happens every Sunday morning at 10.30 on Zoom, and you can receive an invitation by contacting the parish office. Um.